I'm going to be back in the book of Isaiah. Maybe the most amazing book in the Bible. It's got 66 chapters that go right along with the 66 books of the Bible. I'm in Isaiah chapter 2, which will line up with the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus. And Isaiah, he gets dreams and visions from the Lord. He gets to see the future just like John, the apostle, saw the future in the book of Revelation. And he sees some things. He sees some things and writes them down. In Isaiah 2 and verse 1, it says, The word, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So Isaiah had the word given to him in visions. He literally saw it with his own two eyes. Now, we don't get dreams and visions, but we have the word given to us in 66 books. And when you're reading it, try to picture it in your mind. Then you can say, you saw the word. But this is the word Isaiah saw concerning who? Concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Doctrinally, it doesn't directly concern us because it's concerning Judah and Jerusalem, but we can still get infinite amounts of practical truths from it and enjoy the prophecy of it. And we can also find out what the millennium will be like where we're going to live and reign with the Lord. So he says, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Judah is the tribe the people, Jerusalem, is the city. And it says in verse 2, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Now this is a millennium verse. It speaks of the future 1,000-year reign of the Lord Jesus that would take place after the tribulation. You see, after the tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come out of the clouds on a white horse with ten thousands of his saints, and he's coming to take over, and he's going to have a physical, literal reign on earth where everybody on earth can see it. And the things that the Lord is saying are going to literally happen in the last days. What you're reading is your future. It says in Isaiah 46, 9 through 10, it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Now, notice this. He says in verse 10 of Isaiah 46, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So, the Lord sees the end from the beginning, and what he says is it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. You see, you don't need psychics or palm readers or tarot cards or fortune tellers or anything like that. You have the Lord who is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. And he's sitting here telling you that... He is going to reign. He is going to be at the top. He's going to be exalted in that day. He knows the outline and events of history from eternity past to eternity future. It said back there in verse 2 that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. So possibly the earthquake that happens at the second coming will put Mount Zion as the highest point on the earth and King Jesus will sit at the top on a throne as King of the hill. And it says, shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. The place where we go to worship the Lord will be exalted above the same hills where they used to worship their false gods. And 2 Kings 17, 10, and they set them up images and groves in every high hill 
and under every green tree. See, they use those high hills and those groves and high places to worship their false gods. And they would do it under trees and in gardens. But no more idols during this future time. Isaiah 2.18 says, The idols he shall utterly abolish. The Lord alone is going to be exalted in that day. It says in verse 2 in Isaiah chapter 2, in verse 2, and all nations shall flow into it. You see, the nations will have to come up to worship the Lord at Jerusalem. Now in Micah 4, 1 through 5, it, it's really similar to Isaiah chapter 2. It says in Micah 4 and verse 1, but in the last days, there's that phrase again, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains and it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow into it. It's going to be the Lord who is worshipped in the high place, not the idols. And it says, And many nations, many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So you see how that closely matches Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 2. Speaking of that future millennial reign where Jesus Christ reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords. In Isaiah 2.2 2, it says, And it shall come to pass. This is literally going to happen. Anything the Lord says, you can put all your money on it. It's literally going to happen. He says in Isaiah 2, 3, And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So the mountain of the Lord will be the number one tourist destination. Many people, the nations are going to have to come to Jerusalem to worship the king. He says the house of the God of Jacob there in Isaiah 2, 3. He says Jacob's name, because you see this has to do with Israel. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. He had 12 sons. Jacob has 12 sons, which turn into the 12 tribes of Israel. And in the millennium, Israel will finally get the land promised to them and inhabit it without fear. That's what's going to happen in the future, in the millennium. It says, and he will teach us of his ways. You see, we won't need a prophet or a preacher or a big-time evangelist anymore. The living word, the Lord Jesus, will teach his written word. The author will read his own book. The greatest teacher will expound unto us in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, just like he did in Luke 24, 27. It says there in Isaiah 2 and verse 3, we will walk in his paths. Everybody's going to be off the wrong path. And as, uh, in Psalm 119.35, it says, Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. We're going to be on the right path. We're going to walk in his path. He's going to teach us of his ways. It says, For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So you're going to have the Lord Jesus at the top, king of the hill. He's going to teach us of his ways. He's going to rule and reign by his law. Out of Zion shall go forth the law. Imagine a place that is ran by the law of the Lord as the handbook. You got the law of the Lord as the handbook. You're not going to have no more drug trafficking, no more sex trafficking. Your kids can play in the streets without fear, and you can keep your doors unlocked. Imagine being in a place where people 
will actually care about the word of the Lord. Today we're living in a self-inflicted time of famine because people starve themselves of the word. As, uh, Amos 8.11 Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Nobody's hearing the words of the Lord anymore because they have self-inflicted themselves with a famine of the word. And he says back there in Isaiah 2 and verse 3, he said, Out of Zion shall go forth the law. That is how he will rule and operate in the kingdom. And you can see Matthew 5 through 7 for the constitution of the kingdom, how he's going to run it. And this brings us back to Exodus. Remember how I told you that each book of the Bible will line up with each chapter of Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 2 will line up with the second book of the Bible, Exodus. And when it says here, out of Zion shall go forth the law, that takes you back to Exodus, the second book of the Bible, where Moses brings us the law. Remember, Isaiah chapter 2 co coincides with the, the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. It says, and he shall judge among the nations, in Isaiah 2, 4, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So it says, He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. You see, there will still be sin in the millennium, but, but it will all be kept in check and dealt with by the Lord Himself. Obviously, we won't be sinning in our glorified bodies. But you will have those who come into the kingdom from the judgment of the nations who are going to be in natural bodies. Those who didn't fight and die in Armageddon somehow survived through the tribulation, didn't die in Armageddon, and they were good to the Jew. And like it talks about in Matthew 25, you, they're going to come into the kingdom in a natural body. So there's still going to be people being born in the millennium. And from those people that are born in the millennium, Satan even is able to form an army as the sand of the sea in multitude, according to Revelation 20 and verse 8. And these people in natural bodies that come into the kingdom, that's who he's going to have to judge. That's who he's going to have to rebuke. Because not necessarily are they going to be for the Lord entirely in his policies. So he's going to rebuke many people. In Isaiah 2, 5, it says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. So this house of Jacob, that's Israel. That's what this is doctrinally about. They will be a light to the Gentile nations in the millennium. It says in Isaiah 62, 1 through 2, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. You see, O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. That's what the millennium is going to be. There's going to be light. Not darkness like it is now. The salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. So he says, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Just like me and you today, we need to walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk in the light as he is in the light. First John 1 John 1.7 For if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. You see, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But in the millennium, we're going to walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah 2, 6, Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves and the children of strangers. So the Lord forsook the house of Jacob because they be replenished from the east. 
because they're soothsayers, because they please themselves and the children of strangers. This verse goes back into Israel's condition in the Old Testament. We were just talking about their future condition in the millennium. Now we're talking about their condition in the Old Testament. They've replenished from the east. This has to do with their alliances. You see, bad things come out of the east in the Bible. In Exodus 10, 13, watch out for the 13s, the east wind brought the locusts in. In Genesis 13, 11, watch out for the 13s, Lot went east to settle in Sodom. In Ezekiel 8, 16, sun worshipers faced toward the east. You see, the east is mostly negative in the Bible, and they replenished from the east. Their alliances, that's where they got their alliances and uh, got mixed up in a lot of bad things from the east. It says, and our soothsayers, like the Philistines, soothsayers are diviners. They give you something positive, kind of like Balaam and kind of like how fortune cookies only tell you positive things. Goliath, the giant of the Philistines, means soothsayer. And it says they are soothsayers like the Philistines. He's saying that Israel is like the enemy wicked nations around them. And it says they pleased themselves in the children of strangers, meaning they took pleasure in intermixing with the God-hating nations around them. And they pleased themselves, just like men today, all about pleasing themselves. But what is... The Bible say, for even Christ pleased not himself. Imagine if the Lord, when he was down here, just said, when it was time to die on the cross, he said, he said uh, uh, I changed my mind. I'm going back to heaven. Uh, he didn't do that. He pleased not himself. Israel was worried about pleasing themselves. You go to work, what are people worried about? Helping others, taking care of you, taking care of the people around them. No, they just want to please themselves. That's the problem today even. They want to please themselves. It says in Isaiah 2, 7, Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. So notice that they got silver, they got gold, they got treasures, and those are all temporal things. Just as today, you see, Israel had lost sight for eternal things. Think about America. Think about yourself. You've lost sight for eternal things. You're thinking about the silver. You're thinking about the gold. You're thinking about the treasure, the material stuff. It says their land is also full of horses. Psalm 20 and verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. You see, chariots and horses can't help you. The Lord God Almighty can help you. Your silver and golden treasures can't help you. You need to be thinking about eternal things. In Matthew six nineteen through 21, it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Consider America. They're more concerned with the silver and the gold and the treasures and maybe not horses anymore, but horsepower. They're more concerned with the transportation than they are with the eternal things of God. In Isaiah 2, 8, it says, Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. They worship the work of their own hands. They are very impressed with themselves and their accomplishments. It makes no sense to worship a God that you made. Wouldn't it make sense to worship the God who made you? But they... Their land is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. 
take a look around at your nation. It's a land full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands. They make statues of men. Men that they worship. Athletes like Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Babe Ruth. They got statues of men. Their land is full of idols. In Isaiah 2, 9, it says, And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore, forgive them not. The mean man is the little good-for-nothing men. Contrast with the great men. And they're not bowing and humbling themselves toward God. They're bowing to their idols. So he says, Therefore, forgive them not. That's because they're unrepentant. They're not even trying to get forgiveness. They're bowing down and humbling themselves to false gods. They're not bowing down and humbling themselves to the Lord or He would forgive them. It says in Isaiah 2.10, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. You know what's going to happen at the second coming? When Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, Behold, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. When he comes back on the clouds with ten thousands of his saints, they're going to hide in the rocks and in the caves. They think they can hide from the Lord in caves and underground bunkers. That's not too hard to believe because they think they're hiding their sin from God now. They think God's not seeing their sin now. In Revelation 6.15, it says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. It says in Isaiah 2.11, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Notice that phrase, in that day. You see it over and over again in Isaiah. You see it over and over again in the Old Testament. That refer refers to a future time, the millennium, the second coming, those future end times events. Matthew 23, 12, it says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Remember what the Lord did? He humbled himself it says in uh, philippians 2 8 and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross and what did matthew 23 12 said whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that humble himself shall be exalted that's what's going to happen to the lord the lord alone shall be exalted in that day nobody humbled himself as much as him Nobody's going to be exalted as much as him. But notice that phrase, in that day. It will consistently be connected with the second coming and the millennial reign of the Lord. And remember that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Second Peter 3, 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So the millennium is the day of the Lord. And it crosses over with the second coming and some of the tribulation. So that's what it's referred to when you see the day of the Lord, when you see the phrase in that day, it's automatically putting, in, putting you in that future context. Not only will the Lord be king, because he's already king of kings, he will be the most high king because he earned it. The Lord alone shall be exalted. Matching what he demanded back there in Exodus 20, verses 3 through 4. Once again, matching the book of Exodus. He said back there, he's not going to have no other gods before him. In Isaiah 2 and verse 12, it says, For the day of the Lord, there's that phrase, the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty. That's those that have, have exalted themselves, that haven't humbled themselves. And upon everyone that is lifted up. I like the devil who wanted to be like the most high and he shall be brought low. 
You see the day of the Lord just like in that day, connected with the second coming in the millennium. When he comes down on that white horse with ten thousands of his saints at the second coming, he will mow them down. They're going to be brought low. He will thresh the heathen in his anger. It's going to be like cutting grass, just mowing them down. Just like your grass gets high, people are high and mighty, proud and lofty. The Lord comes through and mows them down. You see, the devil is taken down to the bottomless pit at this time. The Antichrist is taken down to the lake of fire. The armies and God-haters will lick the dust. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. You're better off to go ahead and get low now. Humble yourself before God now. Get rid of your proud and lofty attitude now. It says in Isaiah 2.13, And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan. You see, men are compared to trees. You know why? Because they're of great height. And men get their head in the clouds. They lift themselves up like trees. Notice they are also compared to oaks because oaks are negative in the Bible. Jacob hid false gods under an oak in Genesis 35, 4. The young man of God got in trouble when he was sitting under an oak in 1 Kings 13, 14. It says in Isaiah 2, 14 through 15, And upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, all that will be taken over. Think about Noah's flood. There wasn't a mountain, a hill, or place high enough where man could hide themselves. Nothing was too high. Nothing was too lifted up. Nothing was too fenced. Nothing was fenced good enough to keep out of the water. Nothing will be able to hide from the Lord at the second coming. What about in high tower? It says, and upon every high tower... Think about the Tower of Babel. Man couldn't get around God to continue the building. They couldn't build it high enough. In Isaiah 2.16, it says, And upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all pleasant pictures, so all the trading by ships gets wiped out. Men have their affections on things down here. Where it... It says in Colossians 3, 2, Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. The only unsinkable ship is the one the Lord gave the building plans for back there in Genesis 6 through 9. He said, Upon all pleasant pictures, He's going to destroy the pictures. This is one of man's biggest problems. Today, you not only have pictures, but you also have motion pictures. And men spend a majority of time scrolling TikTok, scrolling Facebook, scrolling YouTube. And there are many tempting pictures. Back there in the book of Numbers 33:52, he actually wanted them to destroy the pictures. It says in that verse back there, Numbers 33:52, Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you and destroy all their pictures. And destroy all their molten images. And quite pluck down all their high places. In Isaiah 2.17 it says, And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down. And the haughtiness of men shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. You're going to live in a kingdom where Jesus Christ is on top of the world literally. He is going to be so high and lifted up that he will be the main topic everywhere you go. You won't have any diatrophies coming in to try and steal the preeminence like he was in 3 John. And in Colossians 18 it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. The Lord's going to get the preeminent place. The Lord alone is going to be exalted in that day. Because in Isaiah 2.18 it says, And the idols he shall utterly abolish. That means he's going to destroy them. He's also abolished death in 2 Timothy 1.10, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death. 
and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. You see, line up all the evil angels, the false gods, death himself, and every idol, and the Lord can crush them into powder and make them drink it, just like Moses did with that golden calf back there in Exodus 32. It says in Isaiah 2.19, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. There's that earthquake at the second coming. And the men are going to try to hide in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, but what's the point? The earthquake's going to make them just fall on them. In Revelation 6, 15 through 17, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the, in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You see, these rich guys, they can think they can escape, the Lord's wrath by hiding in the dens and rocks of the mountains. But what about the earthquake that comes along with it? How are they going to hide? In Isaiah 2.20, it says, In that day. There's that phrase again, putting you right back into that second coming and millennium context. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. Notice the phrase again in that day. Men have idols of silver and gold in their pockets today. They made each one for himself to worship. You see, it's not wrong to have objects. It isn't the objects that are evil. It's the worshiping of the objects that are evil. And the fact that these are, they've exalted these things above the Lord. And most likely you're exalting something before the Lord in your life that you need to bring down a notch. But they're going to throw the idols to the unclean animals, the moles and the bats. And though both of those are listed in Leviticus 11, 19 through 30 as unclean animals, the moles and the bats. And if they're throwing their false idols to them, Seems like they found out their idols, idols aren't worth anything. Throwing them to these unclean animals. You ever think about that? Bats listed as an unclean animal in the Bible. What's one of the false gods of, the day, of today that people have all over their walls and they look up to Batman? People worship and serve the creature more than the creator. It says in Isaiah 2, 21, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. He shakes terribly the earth. There's that earthquake. The rocks, the ragged rocks and underground bunkers that they've made for themselves are just going to crumble up and they're going to go and hide in the dens and those rocks of the mountains. When they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and great glory, with his eyes like unto a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass as if they burn in the furnace, and a sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth. They're going to run for the dens and rocks. In Isaiah 13, 13, it says, Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Notice that, in the day of his fierce anger. Putting you in that day of the Lord, in that day context, that future time. He says in Isaiah 2.22, Seize ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? Seize ye from man. Man's a sinner. Man can't help you. His breath is in his nostrils. The Lord is the one that put breath in man's nostrils originally. Back there in Genesis, he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. If it wasn't for that, you wouldn't even be here. Seize ye from man. Quit relying on him. It's better to trust in the Lord than, than to put confidence in man. 
his breaths and his nostrils. All it would take is for the Lord to stop up his mouth and his nostrils. He couldn't breathe anymore. For wherein is he to be accounted of? That's where you get the saying, he ain't no count. He's not. None of us are of any count. Remember Exodus where, once again, talking about Exodus. Remember Exodus where Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea? He took the breath from their nostrils. Why place confidence in men? All that the Lord has to do is stop their breath. All the Lord has to do is stop their heart from beating and they're done. Why put so much confidence in them? We're living in a time where Christians have placed more faith in Donald Trump being president than they have in the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. They've placed more faith in Trump fixing up things than they have the Lord Jesus fixing up things in their personal life. But that's Isaiah chapter 2. Great prophecies on the second coming in the millennium. And we'll continue with Isaiah 3 next time.